Welcome back. Um, so our next speaker is Adele Nelson. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Art and Art History at the University of Texas at Austin, where she's also the associate director of CLAVIS, that's the Center for Latin American Visual Studies. She received her BA in Portuguese and Brazilian studies and art semiotics from Brown University, and her MA and PhD in art history from the Institute of Fine Arts in New York. She specializes in 20th and 21st century art of Latin America with a focus on the post-war and contemporary art of Brazil. Her current book project is Forming Abstraction, Art and Institutions in Post-War Brazil. Um, Adele is also going to address the question of um, Marxism and the social um, in the work of Valdemar Cordero and the Ruptura group. Wrong way, pardon me. Hi, um, good morning. Thanks so much for being here on a beautiful Sunday um, in a darkened room. Um, I want to thank the team, um, the wonderful, generous team of um, Making Art uh, Concrete for having me here, as well as everyone at the Getty who's been so um, a model of organization and generosity. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge at the beginning um, the generosity of Ana Livia Cordero, Valdemar Cordero's daughter, in sharing research materials. Okay, um, Grupo Ruptura, the rupture group, established in Sao Paulo in 1952 and led by artist and art critic Valdemar Cordero, is considered the first abstract art group in Brazil. Despite this vaulted place in the country's post-war art history, it is commonly characterized as promoting a rationalist, stringent practice of geometric abstraction and unfavorably con compared to the more intuitive, an expansionist approach of Rio de Janeiro-based artists in what would become neoconcretism, the movement launched in 1959 that has received more attention than any of other of Brazil's contributions to contemporary art. And I'm showing you here a work by Cordero on the left from 1956 in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, one of the partners that Tom alluded to earlier in the larger research project. And on the right, a Parangole by Elio Tessica. At first blush, this characterization of the seven-member rupture group as austere and closed off is supported not only by the rhetoric of the group's manifesto of 1952, likely authored by Cordero, which sweepingly denounced much contemporary art as retrograde, but also by the seeming uniformativity of the group's production as displayed in its first and only exhibition. Composed of flat, painted, and precisely drawn geometric forms, on monochromatic grounds, the paintings by Cordero on the left and Jardim de Barros on the right, displayed at the first exhibition, provided spectators sparse realms in which to witness the principles of Gestalt psychology, geometry, and color theory enacted. Based on works like these, we might be persuaded that Rupture's production fulfilled the claim in its manifesto to, quote, conceive of art as a means of knowledge deducible from concepts but assume that the kind of knowledge at stake was rarefied and remote to many viewers and leave us to wonder skeptically if such an art could, as the manifesto claimed, quote, bestow on art a definite place in the scope of contemporary spiritual work. Indeed, skepticism, um, as this is, you know, there's lots of overlap, um, excitingly, between Megan and I's presentation. So skepticism greeted um, Ruptura as well. Um, indeed, skepticism towards Rupture's claims has pervaded its interpretation by allied artists and critics since the mid-50s. From the inception of the critique of Ruptura in the context of the debates following and surrounding the National Exhibition of Concrete Art in 1956 and 1957, and these are some installation views on the right, and by neo-concrete artists um, and poets in their manifesto in 59. This criticism or assumptions about um, Ruptura continued in the foundational historical accounts by Brazilian scholars Araci Amaral and Ronaldo Brito of the 1970s. So 77 is um, a landmark exhibition that Araci Amaral organized, the Projeto Constructivo Brasileiro na Arte, and on the right is Brito's um, book of 1985 that compiled texts that he originally wrote um, in the mid-70s. As this account broadly goes, and in a simplified, highly simplified version, 
The Sao Paulo-based rupture group embodied an important but doctrinaire step in the adoption and practices of the principles of concrete art, an approach first defined by European artists Theo von Dunsberg and Max Bill to define an art devoid of any reference to the natural world and composed solely of geometric forms and focused on mathematical relationships and rhythms. And these are early works by Cordero on the left and Gibajos on the right. It was, to adopt Brito's language, the Rio neo-concrete artist that represented, quote, the peak and the rupture of Brazilian concretism, creating a radical, emancipatory, and holy, rather than provisionally vanguard approach to art, where the work of art becomes participatory and the spectator transforms from contemplative passive viewer to engage active participant. On the left is, um, I've shown you others, but a work from the Cisneros collection on display in the exhibition um, from 56, and on the right is a Ligia Clark um, B show from 1960. The exhibition Making Art Concrete counters this narrative, predicated on the mapping of artistic change leading up to the neo-concrete break, and instead elucidates the aesthetic, material, and conceptual programs and stakes of rupture artists in concert rather than in opposition to those of neo-concrete artists, among other key scholarly contributions. One of those is the regional outlook of the exhibition, which I'm sure we'll talk about in our Q&A, which is um, grounded in um, Marita Garcia's foundational scholarship looking at regional exchange between Argentine and Brazilian concrete artists. Broadly speaking, recent scholarship is less interested in any sort of strict division between Sao Paulo and Rio cultural activities, and in many instances has challenged the evolutionary tale I schematically mapped above to provide insightful new thinking about the kinds of spectatorship and subjectivity created in concrete works. For example, Aleka LeBlanc in her essay in the catalog, Making Art Concrete, speaks of how concrete works, quote, engaged and challenged the viewer's relationship to space. And Irene Spall has described how these works enacted the logical progression of a geometric form until reaching what she characterizes as a stable asymmetry. In addition, Eloisa Espada and Adria, Adrian um, Agarnost have fruitfully focused attention on Cordero's status as a dual Italian and Brazilian national, noting that following his immigration to Brazil from Rome in 1946, he continued his contacts, artistic and intellectual contacts in Rome, and returned for an extended stay in 1948. They argue persuasively that the proposals of Roman artistic groups and organizations of the late 40s served as models for Cordero's objectives with the rupture group. For example, the declaration by the Rome-based abstract art group Forma that, quote, Marxism and formalism are not irreconcilable importantly informs Cordero's intellectual project. In my remarks today, I examine Cordero's early writings and talks of the late 40s and early 50s in order to reconstruct the, to my mind, understudied complexities of the artistic debates and practices of the immediate post-war moment. Two lacunae that I hope to address are how to understand the fascinating heterogeneity oh, of the early practice of artists such as Cordero here, so these are works ranging from the late 40s to the early 50s, as well as Gerardo Gibajo, similarly late 40s to early 50s, that we often explain away as just early works in an effort to emphasize Ruptura's orthodoxy. But what if we instead see these works as indicators of more diverse intellectual discussions among these artists? Secondly, we have largely bracketed the political affiliations of rupture artists, namely in Cordero's case, his involvement with, with both the Italian and Brazilian communist parties. I will instead argue that Cordero cal calibrated the rhetoric and argumentation he employed in defining abstraction to the specifics of the Brazilian political landscape and sought to find common ground with pro-realist aesthetic rivals. The crux of Ruptura's argument as an artist group entailed the conception of art as a form of knowledge and social relation, I'll argue, more so than as a claim to stylistic unity or hard and fast antagonism to figuration. The rhetoric of the manifesto and its claim to reject the old and embrace, quote, all expressions based on new principles fits broadly into many an avant-garde manifesto, but for Cordero, the language of, quote, the struggle between the old and the new had social and material stakes. His published and unpublished writings 
of this period, the late 40s and early 50s, reveal a thinker trying to reconcile the discourses of modernism and formalist art history in order to assert that abstraction was connected to day-to-day -day material reality. Um, on the left is a notebook um, writing, um, and on the right is a text I'll return to in a bit from 1949, his earliest um, programmatic text about abstraction. In other words, the kind of knowledge at, stacks, at stake for Codero in paintings like these was social. Despite his well-earned uh, pardon me, despite his well-earned reputation as a pugnacious, polemical defender of abstract art, his early writings suggest that he was also trying to articulate an understanding of abstraction that would be intelligible and perhaps even attractive to communist partisans. So um, on the left is a um, you know, very well-known work, of, at the time famous work by Portinari, um, Café from 1936, um, and we tend to see these as um, the uh, aesthetic and conceptual pivot that happens after World War II in Brazil, from a social realism to this stringent abstraction. But um, what I'm trying to um, think through here is that maybe there's more in common between these projects than we tend to think. Um, our existing art historical narratives for the post-war moment tend to wish away some of the cultural and political landscapes of the debate of modern art and abstraction as democracy was being reestablished following the demise of the Estado Novo dictatorship of Getulio Vargas in 1945. The debates around art institutions of which Codero was a protagonist reveal that the Vargas state apparatus for culture continued despite this return to democracy and that the demarcation between private and public was far from clear. So during um, Vargas's 15-year rule, um, the federal government vastly expanded its role in culture, for example, creating the Ministry of um, Education and Health, which oversaw the national museums and libraries, the fine arts school, and the national salons. Following the end of the regime in 45, a bevy of new modern art institutions were founded, none more visible than the Biennale de São Paulo, founded in 1951 at the Museum of Modern Art in São Paulo. And it is within the walls of these new modern art institutions that local abstraction flourish. So these are just a handful. You guys have seen lots of black and white images over the last three days, but some more black and white images of um, Calder and Max Bill's exhibitions and two of these um, young abstract artists, Shadal Jibajos on the bottom right there, and um, Amilcar Mavigné up top. The intellectuals who advocated for the um, for the institutions dedicated to modern art beginning in the 1930s were prominent members of the opposition to the Estado Novo dictatorship, including in the case of the Modern Art Museum in Sao Paulo, Sergio Melet and Luis Martins. Melet and Martins and others saw these modern art institutions as tools for democratic change and um, as um, bulwarks against censorship. Despite the oppositional intellectual origins of these institutions, the financial patrons who ultimately founded these new museums, whose rooms you're seeing here, were pro-Vargas members of the elite. Furthermore, the private did not replace or supplant the state apparatus for culture established under Vargas. In fact, the state apparatus, pardon me, hummed along, including under the auspices of Vargas himself, who returned democratically to power in 1951. So at the second Biennale in 53 and 54, for example, Vargas, now a democratically elected president, um, seen here glad handing, um, was the honorary president of an event that displayed Picasso's Guernica, then and now a symbol of resistance to totalitarianism, and provided over, presided over ceremonies praising artists and intellectuals that his prior regime had censored and imprisoned. Most conspicuous among these was political activist and preeminent post-war art critic Mario Pedrozu, who served as an organizer of the Second Biennale and had been both imprisoned and exiled by Vargas. So the complexities of the relationship between the state and the private and um, politics and abstraction are manifold. Codero was, in fact, at the forefront of putting the feet of these new private art institutions to the fire, despite being a beneficiary from the beginning of their attention to his work. So he was one of only three Brazilian artists that was included in the inaugural exhibition of the Museum of Modern Art in um, Sao Paulo. Um, this is the work that we're seeing on the right. 
Cordero held, held multiple roles in the art world. He worked as an art critic, writing for a daily Sao Paulo newspaper. He spearheaded artistic events, including the Rupture Exhibition and the National Exhibition of Concrete Art, and was a leader of several arts organizations, including the Sao Paulo chapter of the Art Club International, an artistic organization composed of leftist artists opposed to the aesthetic strictures placed on artists by the Communist Party, and the more Catholic Club of Artists and Friends of Art. He also functioned as an ad hoc organizer and spokesman for artists, aligning with artists and thinkers with whom he had clashed on aesthetic questions to criticize the private exclusionary nature of these new modern art institutions, particularly the Modern Art Museum in Sao Paulo and its organization of the Brazilian representations for the Venice Biennale, as well as all aspects of artist inclusion within the organization of the Sao Paulo Biennial. Over the course of several years, Cordero and several others, including architect Villanova Artigas, tried to extract reforms from the Museum of Modern Art in Sao Paulo that would institutionalize artist representation within these international art exhibitions. Given the vitriol of the debates about abstraction and realism in Sao Paulo and Rio in the late 40s, and I'm asking you to take my word for that, I'm not gonna talk through that element of the history, um, staged in museum auditoriums, lecture halls, and publication forums like the cultural magazine of the Brazilian Communist Party, Fundamentals, um, Fundamentals Magazine of Modern Culture. It is remarkable that artists and critics like Cordero and Villanova Artigas that had squared off in these aesthetic debates rallied around similar criticisms of art institutions. Cordero's involvement in communist political communities ran deeper than this um, alliance. Despite his vocal advocacy for abstraction, he attended the Continental Congress for Culture organized by Pablo Neruda in Santiago de Chile in 1953 alongside pro-realist designers and critics, a trip that was financed by the Brazilian Communist Party. It's in light exactly of Cordero's seemingly contradictory enmeshment with communist circles that I'd like to take a look anew at his early writings in order to suggest much of what in his rhetoric has come to be read as stringent, um, programmatic, rigid aesthetic formulations should be reassessed as an attempt on his part to formulate a conception of abstraction that integrated Marxist thought. For example, in his first two programmatic texts that I'm showing you on the screen dedicated to abstraction from 1949, Abstraction and Still More Abstraction, he argued that abstraction represented, quote, a resolute qualitative leap end quote, within the struggle of opposing artistic trends. And remarkably, as scholar Vivaldo Moredos has recently identified in this first text, um, quotes an extended passage on dialectics from Stalin's 1938 text, Dialectical and Historical Materialism. An abstract artist evoking Stalin, given his persecution of nonconformist artists and intellectuals um, in 1949, beg begs credulity not to mention um, Cordero's own vocal opposition to the promotion of social realism by the Communist Party. It's worth noting that Cordero does not attribute this quotation and that the passage is a run-of-the-mill explanation of Marxist dialectics. But I would like to suggest that through Cordero's at, at times hit-you-over-the-head integration of Marxist terminology in his early writing, he attempts to find common cause with the pro-realist um, aesthetic rivals and political allies and to articulate how abstraction was to his mind, quote, connected to the material life of our society, never disconnected from real life. In the years that followed these early texts on abstraction, Cordero read and wrote voraciously, inclu including translating large swaths of Michel Sifo's 1949 abstract art volume, and this is you know, a whole notebook full of copious translations of a pretty large book in and of itself. Um, and using his column in the Daily Sao Paulo newspaper, or a da Daily Sao Paulo newspaper, Folia de Manhã, to lavish attention on artists who would come to constitute Hoptura, and to meet out criticism of artists, abstract and otherwise, and critics that he felt had erred in some way. It was in early 1953 when he first mentions a German formalist theorist who becomes central to his thinking over the next few years, um, Konrad Fielder. Going forward for several years, his writing and public talks would be consumed with analysis of and allusions to formalism and modernist art history. 
In this attention, Cordero drew upon the same body of aesthetic and art historical writing that Mario Pedrozu had been mining in his own writings since the 40s. In fact, I'd like to speculate that Cordero was directly responding to the conception of modernism that Pedrozu put forward in his writings of the 40s and 50s, as well as at the Second Biennale in 53 and 54. Pedrozo and Cordero shared the belief that art must engage society and that non-objective abstraction was, socially, was a socially engaged art practice, so countering um, the Communist Party's conception of abstraction. Pedrozo proposed a broad, radically inclusive conception of modernism, wherein creativity is not the sole domain of artists, but part of a larger and, to his mind, spiritual inheritance shared by all. He placed at the center of the modern project, oh, I'm, pardon me, I'm sorry, I will come back to this slide in just a moment. Um, he placed at the center of the modern project um, art of mental health patients and children, as well as outliers, such as Alexander Calder and Paul Clay, canonical figures who nevertheless possessed an unstable status in the teleological mapping of um, modern art. Let me briefly note a distinction between Cordero and um, Pedrozu, which is that Pedrozu was a well-known political activist throughout his life. And this is the slide I'm going back to, pardon me. Um, he was a communist, then a Trotskyist, and ultimately a socialist. He underwent multiple periods of imprisonment and political exile. I alluded to the one during the Estado Novo regime earlier, also during the military dictatorship. Um, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and served in official capacities within political organizations. Nevertheless, Pedrozo's political and artistic activities operated in separate, if at times, intermeshed realms. So for example, he, upon returning to Brazil in 45, um, founded and directed the socialist newspaper Vanguarda Socialista, um, while his art criticism appeared in mainstream daily newspapers, books, and exhibition catalogs. In contrast, Cordero's political activities were more ad hoc and confined to the realm of culture, but his art critical writing is overflowing with political discourse. Cordero was unconvinced by aspects of Pedrozo's redefinition of modernism. For example, the intertwining of the significance of non-objective abstraction with the recognition of the art of outsiders was prohibited according to the Rupture Manifesto, which he characterizes the art of children and so-called primitives as erroneous natu naturalism. We should nevertheless recall that his early practice and that of other Rupture artists demonstrate interests that eclipse a narrow genealogy of constructivism. So again, returning to some of Cordero's early works, um, this painting from the early 50s I showed you before, this is a painting from 49, where he is absolutely thinking through Mondrian, a central figure to the genealogy of constructivism that Latin American artists are um, view themselves as participants in, and in some cases supplanting and fulfilling Mondrian's aims. But I think that Cordero is also thinking about clay in this work. Um, so it's not as simple as we like to think, the history um, that they are processing. Gerardo de Barros is a clear-cut example of a more heterogeneous practice. He was in contact with Pedrozo. He was participating in the art studio at Ingenio de Dentro with mental health patients that Pedrozo was theorizing at the time. There is, so there are differences, many differences between Cordero and Pedrozo's intellectual projects. There's a clear convergence in their intellectual projects and their relationship to formalism. So Pedrozo, this is a um, text from 52, Panorama of Modern Painting that I'm um, speculating that Cordero was um, responding to in part. In this text, he adopts Wolflin's notions of endearing stylistic binaries and um, similar content and approach to many accounts um, of modernism put forward in the 20s and 30s by Conviler, Alfred Barr, who's um, 36, Cubism and Abstract Art Catalog I'm showing you and others. So in the book, Pedrozu proposes a teleological account of modern art in which Impressionism and Cubism begat a succession of artistic movements that can be distilled into two opposing trajectories in his lingo, Expressionism and Constructivism. And we see in Barr's diagram his language for these two trajectories, geometric art and non-geometric art. 
Coderu articulates a broadly similar account of modern art in public talks that he's giving in Sao Paulo in late 53 and early 54, although he tweaks, Cordero, he tweaks Pedroso's terminology and emphasizes the dialectical nature of art history. So rather than expressive and constructive tendencies, he proposes that the two fundamental opposing tendencies of modern art are the art of expression on one hand, and in the case of this text, the art art as a form of knowledge. Other places he characterizes it as art as creation, or art of creation. He pointed to works that were included in the second Biennale. So what I'm imagining from these um, unpublished um, texts that are the scripts for conference um, paper, conference papers, that's the academic speaking, pardon me, public talks that Cordero was giving is he's referencing works that are on view, you know, across town at the Second Biennale while he's making these propositions. So as he's articulating this art of expression versus art of creation or art as a form of knowledge, he's saying, he's using examples from the Second Biennale to illustrate it. So works by Inzor and Munch are seen as examples of the art of expression. He has an interesting passage where he compares cubism and futurism and sort of sees both as contradictory and where they lie within this trajectory. His interpretation of these opposing um, trends is struck through with Marxist thought. For example, he asserts that expressive art is limited to quantitative changes and remains in a, quote, feudal phase, whereas the art of creation, on the other hand, is, um, is involved in qualitative leaps because it conceives of art as a form of knowledge. He also argues that concretism, as practiced by himself and fellow Hoptura artists, most fully embodies this art of creation or art as a form of knowledge and evokes Fiedler, that German aesthetic critic that I mentioned earlier's concept of pure visibility. He quotes at length Fiedler in one public talk in Sao Paulo saying, the activity of visual art captures an aspect of reality that only it and no other spiritual form is able to materialize. Art conquers the reality of the world as visibility, end quote. Elsewhere, elsewhere, Fiedler asserts that, quote, the sole aim of artistic activity is to be found in the expression of pure visibility of the object. Irene Small's understanding of concretism in which the artist's act of composing forms is interchangeable with the viewer's act of understanding them aligns with Cordero's close attention to Fiedler. But, Small characterizes concrete works as, quote, vanguardist in conception and regulative in effect. For Cordero, the privileging of visibility as the ultimate manifestation of reality was revolutionary. So perhaps regulative, but also revolutionary. Only non-objective abstract er works that negated both naturalism and expressionism could forge a transformative radical form of communication with the viewer, he argued. He states, quote, art does not express a reality, it is a reality in itself. As he mapped in a diagram from around 53, 54, concrete geometry is not only, and I'm reading, um, building off of this area, the seam, the yes, the things that he is um, campaigning for. Concrete geometry is not only image, phenomenon, and perception. Um, the lens that we tend to apply to rupture in our interpretation, but also a relation that is dialectical, real, direct. So if with these histories and agendas in mind, we return to the rupture manifesto, and particularly the statement that appears on the back of the manifesto, but what perhaps was the first statement that a visitor to the exhibition would have encountered, because this this is the copy of the manifesto that's in the Adolfo Lerner collection of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and it's folded. So, and on this side, we have the ex telling us it's the exhibition of the rupture group. So perhaps the first statement that someone would have encountered um, of the text, the language accompanying rupture, and what that sentence in red reads is, the work of art does not contain an idea, it is itself an idea. So what I'd like to um, end with is the suggestion that for Cordero and rupture artists, the idea at stake was perceptual, but it was also social. Thank you. <laughs>
the next speaker is uh, Luis Camilo Osorio. He's the professor uh, at the philosophy department at the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro and researcher at the Brazilian National Council for Scientific and Technological Development. He's curator of Instituto Pipa and from 2009 until 2015 was chief curator at the Museum of Modern Art in Rio. Uh, in 2015, he was also the curator of the Brazilian Pavilion at the Venice Biennial. This year, he's uh, the curator of the 35th Panorama de Arte Brasileira, um, which is held at the Museum of Modern Art in Sao Paulo. His most recent book is a collection of essays entitled Olha a Margem, uh, Look to the Edge, uh, Caminhos da Arte Brasileira, Journeys of Brazilian Art. Um, his talk will address the role of color in the development of um, neoconcrete uh, art and the idea of temporality. Thank you. Well, first of all, I also want to thank the Getty team for the invitation to be here. It's a big pleasure and it was part of a seminar that was held at the Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, I think one or two years ago, that was part of the discussion that we are, um, that developed in the exhibition that we have here at the Getty. Um, before starting, I just want to mention two things. Um, first, differently from my colleagues in the table, I'm not an art historian. So I'm, I'm not a critic and I'm trained in philosophy. And so my approach is perhaps full of some historical imprecisions, but uh, that's part of the game. And secondly, uh, this paper is a sort of a work in process, is about put together a few um, works that I've done previously and with a development that is quite new, which is the last part of the, of the paper and also I moved a bit forward in this time frame that uh, the, the seminar is focusing going to the end of the 50s and early 60s. <clears throat> and focusing in the question of color and in Brazilian art, in Rio de Janeiro art, which is part of Brazil. Um, many critics and scholars have written about the development of color in Brazilian art since New Concretism. Generally, taking the work and writings of Elio Chisica as their chief point of reference. This talk does not thus seek to open up a new reading perspective but rather to add some points to the dialogue that might complement this highly singular adventure. Perhaps it is precisely the approach taken to color that has been the most significant element in the Brazilian contribution to the history, history of Western constructivism tradition in the art of the 20th century. <clears throat> the first element that I'd like to introduce deals with the genealogy of this process, of this adventure of color. Where did it begin? Which artists are to be found at its genesis? It's important for us to highlight, first of all, the characteristics of this approach to color that we wish to emphasize. Firstly, its projection, the projection of color, beyond the field of representation, the departure from the two-dimensional plane 
to the real space. And secondly, the inclusion of temporality as a dimension inherent to this aesthetic experience. As Witisika said in 1960, Space, I'm quoting him, is an indispensable dimension of the work. But because it already exists in, already exists in itself, it does not constitute a problem. The problem here is the inclusion of time in the work's structural genesis. End of quote. The relationship between color, the body, and time will be fundamental in the analysis of no concretism and its reverberation beyond the specific field of the visual arts as it seeks to disseminate itself into life. In this regard, I believe that the first influence that needs to be cited is that of Alexander Calder, that was already mentioned briefly <clears throat> by Adele. And this is one of my obsessions to to think about the relationship of Calder with Brazilian art. I did a show with the Calder Foundation last year focusing in this, this dialogue, as it is important to Brazilian art, and I think it is also very important to Calder's reception nowadays. I think it opened a lot, a new reading of Calder's work, this, uh, I think, insertion of Brazilian new concrete art in the main narratives of contemporary art history. This influence, was an indirect, of course, but definitive influence that occurred through the pertinence of the North American artist to Pedroza development in his open conception of the work of art and also inciting the spectator to embrace the plastic event. <clears throat> These characteristics reverberate subsequently in notions of the experience and endurance of color, both representative of what Goulart would call the non-object, and which will be so important to the construction of Oitisica's experimental work. What I wish to suggest is that Calder's mobiles will open up a singular interpretation <coughs> path for the constructive tradition. Having in the three texts written by Pedroza between 1944 and 1948, just after he saw Calder's show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 43, that was an epiphany for, for Pedroza, and he wrote three uh, texts, in, two in 44 and one in 48. <clears throat> and this was extremely, I think, important to the development of Brazilian art in the following years and decade. According to the Brazilian critic, the most important aspect of Calder was his projections of form in space, causing those immaculate, ecstatic, but intensely colored panels from Mondrian's studio to revolve." End of quote. Another aspect highlighted by Pedroza that will reverberate in the Brazilian art scene was the democratic availability perceived in Calder's poetics, both from the point of view of the materials and of participation. According to Pedroza, the mobile, and I quote him, is a democratic art form because it can be made from anything, anything, and fit anywhere in the service of any condition, whether noble, refined, or common. End of quote. And this is also 1944. It is worth citing here, as an addendum to this critical dialogue initiated by Pedroza, a text by Ferreira Goulart from 1960, written soon after the publication of the New Concrete Manifesto from 1959. <clears throat> and in the New Concrete Manifesto, Goulart was the main protagonist, the main theorist. The starting point of his reading of the mobiles, of Goulart's reading of the mobiles now, is the fact that they represent a hybrid experience which abolishes the frontiers between painting and sculpture. According to Goulart, 
there is in Calder's pieces, as in a living body, I want to underline living body, the independent operations of isolated organs within a coherent whole. There is thus here an expansion of time, a moment divided into moments, a present multiplied by presence that endure simultaneously and deepen, expand, and diversify the general duration." End of quote. This intensive time, whose duration causes the present to multiply in multiple presents, is the time of aesthetic experience and play, both of which are run through by the intensity of the duration. We can compare this passage with another from the New Concrete Manifesto. And I quote the New Concrete Manifesto. We conceive of the work of art as neither a machine nor an object, but as a quasi-body, which is to say, as a being whose reality is not reduced to the external relationships of its elements." End of quote. So this quasi-body resembles the living body that he wrote in 1960, and this was in 59. And it was funny because uh, when I interviewed once Goulart talking about Calder, and I asked him, what was the importance of Calder to the new concrete? And he said, none. I said, OK. <laughs> <clears throat> Continuing this analysis and differentiating the experience of the mobiles from that of modern sculpture, Goulart observes that, beginning with mass, sculpture tended to flatness and to the straight line. With the mobile, I quote, <clears throat> that starts, while, sorry, while the mobile that starts with a line and flatness tends to volume and to a new volume, a volume of time and movement, end of quote. This observation of Goulart regarding a volume of time and movement recalls, in turn, Witticica's notion of the nuclear development of color, and I quote Witticica, as if color pulsated from its static state to duration, as if it pulsated within its nucleus and developed. From Calder to Witticica, and new concretism, there was a decade of maturing of the constructive concrete poetics in Brazil, allied to an entire process of modernization. During 48 and 59, there were three important Calder exhibitions in Brazil. In 48, at the Ministry of Education and Health, that Adele showed the, the photo of the Le Corbusier and the Brazilian Architects Building, he showed there in 48, and I like this setting with plants and furniture, everything together, very tropical. And then he showed the same year in 48 at Mashpi, also um, with Lina Bobarding setting the show. And I think for the only time that it was, uh, she used fans to move the mobiles. And, and Color like it. And that was both in 48 at, uh, and in two uh, important well, venues in Brazil, in Rio and in Sao Paulo. And then in 53, the show that also was shown by Adele at the Biennale that Pedrosa in a way curated. And then in 59, the same year of the New Concrete, in the same venue of the New Concrete show, at the Museum of Modern Art. <clears throat> so this, um, during this period between 48 and 59, there were the foundation of two, two Museums of Modern Arts in, in 48 in Rio and Sao Paulo. In 51, the biennial. During this period, we had the consolidation of Brazilian architecture, the creation of Brasilia, and reurbanization projects in, in Rio and Sao Paulo. For instance, Ibirapuera and part of Aterro do Flamengo in Rio. <clears throat> Based 
on this frontier opened up by Calder's contact with Pedroza and later with Goulart, I would like to cite two dialogues that seem essential to me in this adventure of color in Brazilian art. One which is more obvious between Aloysio Carvão and Eloite Sica, and I liked very much because they are together here in the show, in a nice, loving dialogue between the two. <clears throat> and this dialogue between Carvão and Oite Sica, I think they would lead to a corporification of color. And another one that is, for me, more daring, between Eloite Sica and Burle Marx, which implied a temporal experience of color. The, the garden designer, the landscape designer, Burle Marx, who was very influential in Brazil in this period. Most of Carvão's work between 53 and 56 engaged with this flat geometric grid that was integrated into the basic lines of the architectural space, the vertical and the horizontal. The paint was industrial, the kind used for painting cars, and the medium was generally an industrialized agglomerate, such as Alcatex. This material not only had the advantage of being cheap, but it also emphasized the embrace of a mundane, deconsecrated art in harmony with urban life. The conventional rigorous of some moments was always balanced in Carvão by freer, less orthodox works. This is the case with Cornucopia that you can see here from 1955-56. The tone passages, the movement of light, the rotation of the internal space inside and outside the canvas, and the pointillist medium denote a certain principle of individuation that is resistant to the impersonal standard of the concretists. The relationship between color, space, expression, continues to mature towards a liberation of color, of the spatialization of color, between the claro vermelho, the light red phase, and the chromatic phase, which is started a bit early, 57, goes up to 1960, the line proceeds to condense in color, which in turn proceeds to materialize, gaining texture and thickness. Indeed, what this color acquires is its own temporality, which moves indefinitely between tone and form. As Goulart said, again, Goulart writing in 1961 about Carvão, as he said, the color of Carvão's last works, 59-61, and he's focusing in the chromaticas, is at once clear and dense. It neither exposes itself totally to perception nor seeks refuge in dissimulation and tricks. It endures before our eyes. The gaze penetrates it, but never to the point of total deciphering, as if it were lodged in the kernel of the color, in the pope of the color, where perception no longer encounters the resistance of the object and where everything is merely time to perceive." End of quote. Carvão's chromatics, chromaticas, are the most intense and essential examples of this research into the internal time of color. It germinates on the canvas, slowly imposing its rhythm, which disseminates between informing and form, between light and dark. It is color, according to Pedrosa, and I quote Pedrosa, color manufactured from light and chemistry in the painter's alchemist's cauldron, end of quote. We can perceive that one of the ancient deviations, uh, <clears throat> the color here is a bit dark, uh, we can perceive that one of the essential deviations, innovations of new concretism occurs with the inclusion of temporality of the continued coming into being of the aesthetic experience. And some artists, such as Ligia Clark and Elio de Sica, the most known, this is transformed into the inclusion of the spectator, who becomes a participant. In Carvão, this tendency is less radical. It's not 
doesn't produce this move towards participation that Clark and Papi and Uitisika did. He's less radical, but no less interesting. A symbolic separation is still maintained between the work and the spectator. Having said that, we can affirm with no hesitation that without the Kubukur, Witisika's bolides would not exist. The dialogue between these two artists, Carvão and Witisika, is extremely rich and fundamental to the experimentation with color in Brazilian painting. <clears throat> From Witisika's work of the Grupo French, uh, like the meta schemes, and afterwards to the new concrete inventions, bilaterals, and spatial reliefs, the changes from the point of view of the spatial liberation of form and color are clear. It is rare for artists to make such a leap in such a short space of time and reflect so deeply on the process experienced. His relevos espaciais, spatial reliefs, and more emphatically, his nucleus are essentially hybrids. Added to this is the importance of his texts and how they resonate in the works. Without being decisive regarding the ways of experiencing the works, they increase our sensibility to them. They create specific and interesting synchronies between us and the works. In this process of maturing, of the maturing of Oitisika's aesthetics, we are also interested in the path of the specialization of color that was in a way similar, although more radical, to that of Aloysio Carvão. In the final instance, he intended here a rupture with the objectual nature of art and the transformation of the type of experience associated with paintings, with inventions, inventions uh, Oitisika had reached the limit of the pictorial plane, and subsequently, with the bolides and the spatial reliefs, exhausted the possibilities of a closed form that could be experienced at a distance. These two works bring closer the dialogue with the chromaticus, the cernicor, the kernel color of carvão, and also the cubocor. The synthesized temporality on the surface of the painting, the bit of the semicore, the synthesized temporality on the surface of the painting on the pictorial plane begins to seek to manifest itself in the actual space. The space created by the bilateral is active and activating. It established a relationship between surfaces and the space beyond the frame. It involves the spectator as a participant and alters the habitual behaviors of the aesthetic experience. Each stage in the process signifies a forward step in the direction of the liberation of color in the space, the insertion of time and the incorporation of the spectator into the experience of the work. According to Itisika himself, the nucleus open up all the doors to the freedom of color and to its perfect structural integration in time and space, end of quote. The conclusion of this process will occur with the development from the nucleus to the penetraves, the penetrables, and the parangolés. The plates of color hang from the ceiling, suspended from strips, without being thus an environment in themselves. However, they force the spectator to enter into and explore the space through the plaques of color. As the artist explains, the nucleo requires the seeing of work in space and time. The space, the spectator, turns around himself and penetrates inside his own field of action. The aesthetic vision of the work from a single viewpoint does not reveal 
it in its totality. It is a cyclical vision, end of quote. That was Witticica. The temporarily synthesized plastic unit on the surface of the painting no longer occurs. The nucleus are the final development in the liberation of the color plane in the space before the multidimensional and environmental redimensioning. The basic outlines of their future experiences are delineated. The penetravish point to new areas of artistic activity. Departing from an intrinsically constructivist research process focused on the autonomy of the form and on its integration into a new totality, thus taking form as a propagating element of a social utopia, he arrives at this revitalized organic plastic space whose essential premise, premise is the creation of new conditions of experiencing reality, of inhabiting the world. We thus arrive at the core of his poetics, of his originality in the, context, in the context of contemporary art, whose development from the bilaterais to the bolides and parangolais continues in a radical direction where multisensoriality continues to be affirmed and the incorporation of the spectator participant becomes decisive. This expansion indicates the relationship between the pulse of color and the movement of the body. Color as energy and rhythm, which is disseminated throughout the livid space. <clears throat> as Oiticica highlighted in his Projeto Cães de Caça, Hunting Dogs project, composed of his penetraves and the uh, Teatro Integral, the complete theater, integral theater of Reinaldo Jardim, and the poem Enterrado, the buried poem of Ferreira Goulart. This is this complex, uh, Projeto Cães de Caça. And to him, this, pro this project was now a garden. That's Witticica's word. Consider it a garden, which is to say an organic, sensorial space to be penetrated and explored, whose principal characteristic was a singular understanding of the relation, relational temporality of colors, textures, and materials. This approximation to a garden does not fail to interest us from the point of view of these same relationships of colors, textures, and materials which are, were also decisive in the landscaping of Burle Marx. His attention to the temporality of each species in his project is notable in the movement of the leaves, of the branches, in the relationship between the rocks and the grass, and in the verticality of the palm trees. And I quote Burle Marx. All gardens that we create have something that provides the starting point for the composition. Sometimes it's the broad landscape. But in certain cases, you want to structure the project in a highly defined way, creating a kind of contrast to nature, which is apparently disorganized to us. So you seek order, you seek a rhythm, one color in relation to another color, an association of volumes, of small volumes in relation to medium-sized ones, to large ones. All this is structure." End of quote of Boulay Marx. The landscaping project that Boulay Marx produced for Manrio in '54 represents a fundamental moment in the play between construction and nature, geometry and organic forms, both full and empty. According to the researcher Ana Paula Polizu, in this project for Man, Burle Marx imposes a new rhythm on the garden, a new order on the landscape, based on Mondrian's neoplastic experience and the geometry, geometric language of the constructive project. It seems when we pass 
<clears throat> through his gardens, through display of colors, lines, and volumes, that we are in the presence of a genuine foreshadowing of the penetraves and the idea of color time that was so dear to and decisive for Oiticica and new concretism. The flowers and labyrinths in Atejo Park, those labyrinths are um, constructions for children, you see later, in Atejo Park, bearing in mind the chromatic composition desired by the landscaper, respect different times and depend on constant variations in light and texture. What matters in these experiences of color in this insertion into the landscape or into the city is the possibility of transposing an artistic experience into the world of everyday life. The question that these expanded experiences which emerge in the play between color, body, city and landscape introduces is that of the intersection between art and life. How can we allow the creative energy produced by the work overflow into life? This is a similar question to the one, one face. When these experiences of ephemeral nature enter museographic collection, how do we keep and exhibit a bolidi or a parangolé? This is a question that I always make myself when I curate. The impulse triggered by this adventure in color through the mobiles, the cubocor, the parangolés, and the gardens is to invent a new relationship between subjectivity and sociability, experience, endurance, and collectivity. The form always remains a pulsation of form. It is never fixed. It is always other, based on different forms of interaction and experience undergone by the spectator participant. The question posed by this adventure in color remain open. How should we experience them today? How should we display them? Thank you. So I just want to begin by thanking you all so much for your incredible presentations, and not just presentations, but contributions, I think, very important contributions to um, the understanding of concrete art in all of its various forms. Um, and I think, you know, as we, as we hear you all speaking about the different but related subjects, you know, it becomes clear that um, concretism, um, you know, was very <coughs> capacious in its understanding of itself, and, and you know, it's that broadness um, of the concrete project that allowed it to be applied. I think in so many um, different kinds of practices, and um, it's really fascinating um, to hear some of the different ways in which this concrete project was conceived, you know, in different places and by different artists and. Um, I really appreciated, uh, in particular, you know, uh, Megan's attempt to uh, pick apart that the difference between the projects um, of the Ruptura artists in Sao Paulo and the and the Argentine artists, which at first glance might look like they have, um, you know, a, a lot in common, and certainly there are commonalities. Um, one of the I think one of the sort of potent things about the presentations is the way in which us, um, it kind of invites us to rethink the, the historiography um, of the project of concretism in general and as a social rather than a formal project. Um, that's you know, a key point that runs through all of your uh, presentations, this idea of the social or the active um, and the relationship uh, the attempt to bring, um, as Luis Camilo put it, uh, art and life together. 
And then also this question, you know, which is being wrangled with a lot of um, repped wood are being considered the sort of foil for neoconcretism. But I think, interestingly, looking at um, Cardavao's practice helps us to un undo that a little bit. Um, Adele, maybe we'll start with you. Um, one of the um, aspects of the sociality of the Raptura artists that you picked up on, um, of course, was this idea of the social, but there's also, I wondered if it, it would be useful to think um, sort of beyond this rigidity in other ways as well. So, you, you know, the, the social, but maybe also the, you know, the surreality that we talked about yesterday, participation, mm -hmm. um, and time. <coughs> you know, since uh, Camilo talked about time and temporality, uh, do you see those other aspects as well as, as the social as ways in which the Raptura artists have been um, kind of given short shrift? Um, yeah, um, let's see. So on some of those fronts, like I think I am, I'm very interested in seriality. I mean, you and I've chatted about this, so you're teeing me up for something I already um, <laughs> interested in. Um, between both um, both um, rupture and grupo frente, so right, an unmentioned aspect of the, the sort of events, the early events, um, in the adoption of geometric abstraction in Brazil um, and our comments today is a group founded in 1954 um, in Rio um, and neoconcretism itself. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I think, and um, I am a huge fan of Carvalho and haven't, um, like I've looked at works, but where his place, I mean, and this I'm um, citing um, Gabriel Perez Barreto, who's the director of the Cisneros collection, but um, he's talked about us rethinking a history of the moment of the 50s and 60s in Brazil that looks at Ligia Papi and Judici Landau and I think Carvalho. Like if we think of a history with those figures as the drivers of the narrative, like how different our story of this moment would be. Um, I mean, Clark is very interested in seriality, and, but they're, they're interested, I mean, I think something, so I will stop in a minute because I'm just going to keep doing this, but um, <laughs> A question that interests me around both um, concrete and neo-concrete artists' approach to seriality is um, that it's not so much um, variation as also repetition and recognition that's at stake. So like Clark's um, planes on modulated surfaces from um, 57 and 58, um, she is looking closely at Albers' prints, mm -hmm. and we are meant to recognize Albers' prints in those. And so when Alfred Barr goes to Sao Paulo in 1957 as part of the prize jury for the Sao Paulo Biennale and dismisses Brazilian concretism as Bauhaus exercises, mm -hmm. he's of course being, you know, um, a jerk and um, <laughs> dismissive of art that he's not familiar with, but he's not wrong in recognizing the Bauhaus and what Clark was doing. She meant for us to recognize Albers. And then there's this very um, almost uh, like systematic but unsystematic repetition of them. I mean, Clark's, right, it's crazy, those works. There's like multiple layers of plywood. Mm -hmm. There's all these numbers around this, the variations, but it's not mappable. There are duplicates, like there's a work um, in a private collection and a work at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston that are identical. And ostensibly, she meant to make seven of each of them. Mm -hmm. But so it's, it's not seriality, and I think it's, it's yet to be theorized, the mm -hmm. kind of seriality that concrete and neoconcrete artists are interested in. So yes, there's much more than mm -hmm. the social, I agree. Um, in terms of um, your presentation, Megan, I was mm -hmm. really interested. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm supposed to remind you all to do that. Um, <laughs> I was, um, I thought, you know, very, I thought it was very interesting the way you conceptualized the artists um, work around their um, Marxist uh, interpretations. But I wondered how uh, and if you can square that with their sort of later move into um, massifying the object. Um, because, you know, you're sort of proposing that there's this um, attempt at a, a process. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with um, Maldonado um, disowning some of his early works and there's this moment where he says that um, one of the Marco Recortada that you showed is a ni siquiera una obra, it's not even a work. Yeah. 
and, and actually that would support very much your claim that you know, they were working through this process. But yet, I'm interested in this kind of idea that they're not really um, you know, meant to be finished works of art, or that they sort of are connected. I like the idea that they're not discrete works, but um, how does that square with this later move to industrial design um, and interest in sort of massification of modern aesthetics? Yeah, so um, I think my first answer would be that it probably doesn't square. Is and I don't think that the I think that this particular uh, emphasis on on process and no work being I think the way I was describing it to someone is I don't think the work is like a vector it doesn't do this direct thing to you I I don't think that we can carry this forward um, to the move into industrial design except that uh, I was just saying this um, during the break. It's interesting to, if you care, just take the figure of Maldonado and carry him through, um, he sort of insistently says, I don't care what a chair looks like. If one more person tries to make a lamp, I'm going to go crazy. Like, I don't, we don't need to be designing lamps. We don't need to be designing chairs. We're good, we have chairs, we're fine. <laughs> and, but what he's interested in, I think, you know, through the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, perhaps still now, um, is, uh, thinking about how you can design ways of doing things, mm -hmm. uh, design processes, and I think he'd be much more interested in the organization sort of of semiotic systems or processes of working and on kind of complex orders in his later work. That I think carries over. Mm -hmm. um, that even I don't think he thinks that you know the chair is nearly as important as the sort of organizational organization of industrial society itself as a process. So, right. But I don't think that we can take this model that was really these two years and mm -hmm. apply it forward, but I do see something mm -hmm. carrying through. Did you have? Well, I, I was just yeah. curious, Marita, um, your work on Maldonado, mm -hmm. like um, your thoughts. Yes. <laughs> Very <Please>. general. <laughs> but right. I don't want to put you on the spot. Yeah. Um, but the love what she said. Exactly, about, about Maldonado. Maldonado's later. No, yes, I'm, I'm agree with you in the sense that I think he was not interested in, in doing design. Mm. Uh, I think his, his interest is trying to think the place of the design in the society and the possibility to become this practice into a scientific practices. Well, this debate with Bill, I think that is the, the core of his interpretation and his project. Mm -hmm. I don't know yeah. if yeah. I was thinking yeah. about that. So in some sense, um, you know, the, the, the breaking with the frame that um, you talk about and give us so much amazing information about, um, that helps us to understand where it comes from, you know, is this act of connection um, to the social, in any case, in you know, in all of mm -hmm. the different movements that we see, um, I really enjoyed your kind of undoing of uh, that um, project, you know, and the, and the lineage of of Rothfuss. And do you think that um, you know the the process that you've been through does it give you a, a, a different understanding of what the Marco Recortado uh, was then kind of employed to do? in Buenos Aires, because of course there's a shift um, in the, its kind of moment of invention by Rothfuss, and then its kind of introduction into the Buenos Aires scene. Hmm. Let me think. Um, well, I don't know, I think that um, for me was important as I tried to, to explain Try to focus on, on in the origins of this proposal, in the origin of this displays, and in that sense, I agree with with you in this idea that put it in the, in this social environment, in the sense that try to connect this display with um, trad um, popular traditions, parties, and all that thing that I, I think I have explained. Um, I don't know. I think that the way that they a practice, the Marco Recortado cutout frame in Buenos Aires, keeps the the same line, but I don't know. I think that was was not totally connected in the same way that perhaps was for Rothfuss in 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 the in his 
um, Montevideo and in connection with all these tradition and, and legacies mm -hmm. that I think that he uh, keeps to 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 do to to wait, to um, to practice this this display. I think that this was a way that they um, took to yes to dismantle this. Uh, tradition and painting, and I think it was very useful to try to go forward this modern art, European and international tradition. Mm -hmm. Well, it's quite extraordinary the suggestion that there is um, sort of indigenous aesthetic mm -hmm. at the base of um, you know what is really considered to be a formalist project, and helps us to revise you know that notion of the social. Um, not just the, the idea of the indigenous aesthetic, but the, um, the relationship with the carnival and um, the use of the materials. Well, in connection with that, I, I want to thank um, Andrew Perchuk because when we met in Belo Horizonte regarding these uh, meetings that we have in this project that uh, we, are, we, are, we were to three groups, um, Andrew asked me about the, the human being in, in Arturo, this idea to try to focus, this idea of, of the human being in Arturo. And I keep trying to think on this um, issue. And, and yes, I think that this idea to, to try to, to open Arturo to another traditions like figurative issues, indigenous, indigenism. And, and I think in that sense, I, I love the idea to to try to think this beginning of the concretism with the end of the concretism, as you, as Luis Camilo uh, explained with Elio Chisica, in the sense that I think that is, I don't know, I think it's more uh, studied this idea that the pop as popular uh, traditions and popular uh, houses are, you know, of the things that. In, is connected with Elio Tisica and, and Parangole and Carnival and all that things. And, and the idea of the body, of course, to is an, a core of their proposal. But I think try to think in the beginning of this um, project, some, some of this idea that came or, or makes sense in that moment too. I don't know if you can understand me. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah, it okay. makes a lot of sense. And then, um, Camilo, just to pick up on um, your mention of, of Berlin Marx, is there, um, I mean, I know that he was very influential that, and th at that time, and I was wondering about um, the connection also with Ligia Clark um, and the development of the, her ideas of the organic line, and if there's a sort of intersection there with Oitasika and, and Clark and, and Berlin Marx. Mm -hmm. Um, in the early 50s, Bula Marx was Ligia Clark's teacher, art teacher. And there are some, in the transition from some figurative paintings to abstraction in Ligia Clark, and this, um, this influence of Bula Marx is quite strong. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that the The organic line, I don't see very much the relationship with Bulle Marx. Mm -hmm. I see more her relationship with architecture. Mm -hmm. It's funny, she, in, the, in the 50s, I think 57, she made a, a model for a, a house mm -hmm. and but she wasn't an architect, so she couldn't uh, develop it. And so she asked some architects to write about her architectural skills. So she could, and she worked with Sergio Bernardes too, so she had an architect to sign. And Niemeyer, I'm not sure if Niemeyer wrote that or if she, he asked her to write it, he signed. <laughs> because it's brilliant. Uh, Nehemiah was brilliant, <laughs> but I think that he was, he, the way that he explains the organic line in terms of doors, windows, mm 
passages, movement, and the interaction of um, inside and outside, it's very clever, and it's just one, two paragraphs. And, and so she was very much into this idea of architecture, and she was, and the Bishu also was a development of this because she wanted to sell it in kiosks mm -hmm. in the street. So the idea of seriality was important to, to her to, to disseminate the, the, the creative process uh, uh, into, into life, into, into, to be used. And, and I think that the landscape design of Boulevards, I, I want to think much more in terms of color, mm -hmm. which is not Ligia Clark's field. Right. And so the relationship of Oitisica. Boulevard Marx always started his garden projects with color patterns, mm -hmm. color relationships. And then in the beginning, he was discussing with someone with botanical uh, background to pick up the right flower that would blossom in the right moment that the colors will be related. Mm -hmm. But then he, he, he learned and he, he made sort of uh, uh, botanical uh, journeys, travels right, to in the Amazon expeditions, mm -hmm. and he became quite uh, uh, um, technical in terms of the which species and which relationships, the timing that they need to blossom. I mean, in Atehu, it's uh, brilliant Amazing. in that terms. Uh, in April, one area blossoms, and in September, other area, in the relationships that they establish. Mm -hmm. And so, and it, this is color, this is a penetrable, where you walk through, and, and so I think the relationship, it's interesting. And it's funny because I was thinking that normally uh, we have uh, to think of concretism, the importance of Max Bill, and then you have Oitisika is going to Mangueira and, and his relationship with Samba, which is both is really important, mm -hmm. it's, and, and especially. I like this of similarities in the, the, the way you both established, mm -hmm. you and Marita both established these like lineages which were different, you know, from the yeah. ways that. Yeah, and I think that start. color is very important, and Boulet Marx is very important because I want to think of color. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and that's, that's why I picked up. We're kind of running out of time, I'm, I'm afraid. I actually wanted, um, just before we open it to questions, um, I thought it would be productive to ask um, you, Megan and Adele, to respond to each other because there were so many connections between you. <laughs> I haven't formulated anything. I was yeah. very excited and um, interested in your talk, and I think the distinction between Marxist philosophy and Marxist as practiced by political parties, or I think technocrats or bureaucrats, yeah, you yeah. said at one point, mm -hmm. is a really fruitful um, one. Um, do you? Th I mean, what what I should have asked is, you know, yeah. do you think that there's a distinction, a clear distinction between the modes of practice, um, you know, as outlined, um, suggested by by Megan, like? Um, do you see those as being informed by Marxism in distinct ways? I'm intrigued by that idea. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think. I mean, Marita, I'd be interested in your ideas because yeah. you've thought about the relationship between Brazilian and Argentine concretism mm -hmm. a lot. But um, I mean, I think there's a, I mean, I was building off of Cordero's writings a lot, some of which were published, some of which were given as public talks, some of which were, no, you know, that diagram I showed I wasn't published in any sort of form that I found. Um, so far, so I think um, the realm that I was operating in was in um, speculation <coughs> in some ways. Mm -hmm. So I think, and you yeah. were thinking in, in, also I'm sure speculating, but um, also not. the dynamics of reception of the way those, I, anyhow. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Go ahead. Well, uh, what struck me um, listening, uh, since I haven't had the chance to go through, uh, I've seen some Cordero materials, but I haven't gone through the archive, is in some ways, the similarities, though, of some of their language. I mean, this thing you pointed to about um, this jump from the quantitative to the qualitative, I and mean, that's something the AA 
CI is definitely talking. I mean, this is also like very textbook, you know, Marxist philosophy at this time, and, and his emphasis on relation. In some ways, they're the same terms, but I think they're being, and I actually would think that one could take the idea of method that I was sort of suggesting and say that Cordero is also working with an idea of method, but I think we'd have to distinguish what, these, what method means for all of them, what relation means differently. But I think the set of terms in some ways is probably, is I think surprisingly similar. Okay, let's um, open it up to the, um, the audience. Okay, please wait for the microphone. This is a, a question for uh, Marita. I'm uh, curious, uh, one of the personal obsessions of Maldonado is the defining what is design and uh, how design relates to everyday life and art as a kind of form of design. Um, he starts like thinking on that probably in the 1946, 47, publishes something in the Boletin de Estudiantes, I think 48, and then it became this obsession that, particularly in this book, uh, Industrial Design and Reexamination, that he goes back and forward, you know, on this idea. And uh, I'm curious to see if there is any relationship between uh, this idea of uh, breaking the edge of, uh, of a painting and turning a, a painting in a some sort of object that, that they were developing in the late, late, late 1940s and this, this idea of uh, design uh, of, uh, art, not as a bi-dimensional symbol, as a tri-dimensional uh, piece of art that is more uh, uh, something that can be produced serially instead of something that is a unique piece. Do you want to speak Spanish? Yes. All right. Oh, can I, I, you do a short version in Spanish real quick? Please. Diana, I couldn't understand very well. Okay. <laughs> Una de las obsesiones personales de, de Maldonado es eh, definir qué es diseño y cuándo, na, cuándo, se, cuándo aparece diseño dentro de la historia de la humanidad. Es un tema que él, él trata desde finales de los 40, sí, sí, sí. lo publica en el Boletín, Boletín de Estudiantes de y después en Diseño Industrial un reexamen sí, sí. muchas veces. Eh, esas ideas van un poco en, en paralelo con uh, lo de ese momento donde están experimentando con, con romper el plano eh, Rotsus y sus compañeros y quisiera saber si, si ves alguna relación entre esa idea de, de el, el arte y diseño en la vida diaria con, con esa idea de romper, romper la, 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 la planaridad del arte, una cosa de bidimensional y transformarlo en algo que sea más tridimensional y que sea capaz de ser producido serialmente. But I think there are different moments in his career because uh, he started with this idea of cutout frame at the, you know, 1944, 1940, until 1947. Then that's the moment that he decided to quit with this experiment of cutout frame and he decided to uh, recover the um, rectangular painting, and it, this is the same moment when he started to think about design. Of course, this, I think this idea of design is very close and is in, it's the core of a um, constructivist tradition that was very important for, for them, and as Megan explained, all this um, group, all, all this ideology, Marxism ideology, ideology and this relationship with uh, Russian Revolution and Soviet constructivism was very important for this, for him from the beginning. But I think the idea of design, in the sense that the definition of design was something that appeared after, after cutout frame. No sé si te respondí. Are we allowed to make questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> it's prohibited. <laughs> no, um, I'm interested in one aspect of Megan uh, essay in the relationship of uh, 
Pedrosa and, and, and Cordeiro's Marxists. Mm. And because I think that, I remember that when Pedrosa came back with the, the Vanguard Socialist Journal, when he came back from exile, he was in the States. Yeah. And first he went to Paris, and then he went to Washington and New York. And um, <clears throat> he translated the Trotsky Crest Manifesto of uh, the Free and Revolutionary Art Manifesto of Trotsky in, I think, in 45. Okay. But the, the manifesto is from 37. Yeah. And don't you think that uh, this idea or this assumption of freedom in Pedrosa is the main point to his Marxism, which is not for Cordeiro, mm -hmm. oh, yes. which is, a, in a way, in that sense, more Stalinist. Yeah, well, I think that uh, Pedrosa is a Trotskyite, and then he's not even that. But I think that if he has a Marxism at this point, it is a Trotskyite idea of individual creativity and freedom. Absolutely. Yeah, no, nothing to do with what Cordero is doing. Yeah, yeah very. Um, I think that um, something I don't know enough about the details in Brazil was whether there were like arguments between if the Pedroza Cordero thing turns into a Trotsky versus not Trotsky sort of thing. Mm. No, I mean yeah. the the um, the response to Pedroza that I was speculating upon is a speculation that hasn't. So that yeah. was not there was not a debate between Pedroza and Cordero mm. about Cordero's interpretation of mm. modern art. This is um, and I I think there are many distinctions, but I think that Cordero was responding to Pedroza in a way that hasn't been talked about. That he was looking at. Pedroza's account of modernism and coining his own terminology and making a different argument. But I think that distinction is a very useful one, mm -hmm. Camilo, that you made between the focus on freedom mm -hmm. by Pedroza and me. I, that's interesting that you now, like the identification of that quote that you think that Cordero's thinking is more in line with a sort of regulated Stalinist yes. communism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Not emancipation. <laughs> <laughs> Aleka, uh, can we have a microphone, please? Um, thank you all for fabulous papers um, and wonderful to kind of see these these discussions that I've been having with all of you for such a long time begin to uh, continue to evolve. One of the things I really appreciated about all four papers is a new kind of um, more kind of elastic contexts that you were that you were constructing and connections that were um, looking kind of beyond either the specific groups, looking broadly at uh, you know with the Marxism or even Adele um, talking about Cordero potentially looking at Enzor and Munch and th some of these other kind of outer connections. But to I wanted to just kind of pick up um, back with what Zana started the panel with, saying that there is this kind of thinking about these artists and these works in a social context, right? Like thinking about them in this larger larger frame. You know, I'm thinking about other artists that were painting at the time um, beyond, you know, not geometric artists or other abstract artists that were working in these cities at the time. And the thing that always comes back to me is, you know, Portinari, right? He gets, he has the commission for Guerra y Paix from 52 to 56. And you know he's he's always been the main artist that has been championed by Vargas and by the by the state. And so, just try just and you know also you have in Buenos Aires, right? You have Antonio Berg and you have other artists that are of a very different style. Who are the, you know, who have ascended, right? They're the they're the established artists. And so I just um, I don't know if there's if it's possible to think about these conversations of these artists and these groups, how, they, how those things might be pushing up against this kind of larger context in which they were working, or not, or rejecting it, or kind of how, that, how that's in dialogue. I mean, Adele, you made the point that maybe Cordero and Portinari aren't so far apart. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, this, I think that Cordero was trying to articulate, in some cases, articulate an understanding of abstraction that would be attractive to somebody like Portinari, unsuccessfully, but trying to mm -hmm. 
you know, with this hit you over the head Marxist rhetoric. But I think that like, you know, the um, re-questioning genealogies and um, lineages, I mean, I think like I was totally persuaded by Petaruti being central to mm -hmm. Rolfus, which I've never thought of that before because we in art history tend to think of these breaks, right? Yeah. It's always a break and the Portanati Cordero, we, it is a break, of course it is, but just to try to nuance mm -hmm. the discussion that was happening post-war and in your case, nuance our sense of the, you know, the Argentine or Rio de la Plata mm -hmm. avant-garde um, or distinguishing between two contexts, I think is, right? We're all excited mm -hmm. by that. Yeah, <laughs> and, and just, I mean, a lot of us have talked about this already, but you know, looking at these exhibition programs in some of these institutions, and mm -hmm. we tend to focus on those exhibitions that serve our arguments, or you know. Mm -hmm. But at the same, you know, you have there are a lot of other exhibitions, and I know at Mom in Rio they had a Portinari exhibition early mm -hmm. on. You know, I mean, so these mm -hmm. things weren't um, so neatly cut off, and uh, so oh, anyway. we can't forget that uh, Pedroza wrote about Portinari in the thirties, yeah. and because in a way. He, he was close to Mario Andrade too, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and but then, in after turning back from the U.S. and getting in touch with um, well, in Paris and in, in in the U.S. in New York with abstraction, he tried to right. um, back up this these right. trends. And, and I think, I remember yesterday, Marcos said that he got Sebastião Salgado as his inner enemy. And I think that <laughs> after late 40s, mm -hmm. Pedroza got Portinari as a sort of inner enemy yeah, yeah. to combat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Okay, yeah. Oh, no, last comment. Just to thank you, Lego, for the question, because I was thinking about that because in, uh, there is something uh, repeated in the literature about Arturo, is that Antonio Berni was the person who taught Maldonado the use of the line of, the line of cut. Mm -hmm. So, well, that thing that in the, in really when you read the, um, these manifestos and the relationship between the artists, um, apparently they hated and of course they were enemies between each other's, but this situation of genealogies and lineage uh, have more sense in a, mm -hmm. in a sure artistic milieu. Yeah, yeah. I guess just to, um, to the close, um, one of the, you know, the proposition of um, Camillo was to think about exhibiting these works. And it seems like, you know, if like a proposition like Megan's, which is to think of the works as, um, process, the dialectical process, means that, you know, the, the, the moment of um, exhibiting them or the way that we put these works within the museum context really um, helps to divorce them from that um, sociality that you are trying to invoke. So I think it's quite, it was quite a pertinent way to close. I'm afraid we have to... Mm. Sorry. Um, so we're going to have final uh, closing remarks from, uh, from Andrew Perchuk now, and we can take our seats. Thanks. Mm. It's been a remarkable two and a half days. Um, one of the things I think I learned was that one should pay more attention when one is in the planning stages of a conference that one is participating in. Otherwise, you find your name listed under closing remarks, <laughs> uh, which is a truly impossible task. Um, so I think that one of my, uh, or the most important thing I have to do is thank both the speakers and the audience for going with us on this two and a half days of experimentation. Um, I've never been at a conference that combined uh, pre-Hispanic art and archeology, span um, Latin American architecture and urbanism, 
Argentinian photography and concrete and neo-concrete art with two artist interventions uh, thrown in. So the results of any experiment take some time to percolate. And I probably am not the, would not be the best person uh, to sort of sum up what some of the results of that experiment would be because I'm not an expert in any one of the four uh, subfields that were under discussion here. But I can offer a few provisional thoughts on some of the um, touch points between the first would be that um, Gabriel Perez Barea said to me that any conference like this in the United States that does not focus around the twin questions of what is Latin American art and is there a Latin American art is already a success. <laughs> so in that sense, I think um, we've had two and a half days of success. But within that, I think that how we began on Friday, you know, when we um, when we started, when we decided to do uh, Pacific Standard Time LA LA, there was a lot of discussion about jettisoning the term uh, Latin America. As one of the speakers said. Uh, there is no Latin American art, just a shared set of problems. But I think that what we learned uh, on Friday, tracing out the movement of gold work uh, and other luxury goods up the spine of uh, South America into Mesoamerica is that artistic um, networks, phenomena, do not um, obey national, especially modern national, barriers. And that there is some value, if not to a term like Latin American art or Latin America, to something that goes beyond um, the modern nation state. And I think this morning continued that when, I mean, I'm part of the project Making Art Concrete works from Argentina and Brazil in the Cisneros collection, but we of course ignore that Uruguay, which is, as we heard this morning, a key component in the evolution of concrete art and we just subsume it into Argentina nowadays. Um, something else that I started on Friday and continues today is uh, the possibilities of material science or technical art history. Uh, not just to answer empirical questions, but also to help guide interpretation. And it'll be interesting to see how that develops in the field in the next series of years. I was very interested in that on Friday, uh, in the midst of um, an archeological discussion of um, pre-Hispanic work, is where the question of gender came up most prominently. And the idea that uh, our assumptions about things like gender actually color what we discover, that we assume that a figure um, was male because it has gold or nose ornaments, uh, and you know, then we discover that 
with some material science work that it, it is a female figure and how much, how useful or not the binaries that structure um, thought, whether it be, you know, male, gold, female, silver in the uh, pre-Hispanic past war, indigenous European, concrete, neo-concrete. Um, I'm not sure that one can get beyond uh, certain binaries in thought, but to really see what they allow and what they tend to limit. Um, I was particularly struck without a background in, in uh, architecture, the idea that in response to the fear of both an indigenous population and an indigenous nature led to an urban form that kept both out through the imposition of a grid, the imposition of geometry, and that later the, uh, the incorporation of certain indigenous, especially indigenous nature into the urban form led to a loosening of the grid, uh, the imposition of diagonals over a rectilinear form. And while I think it's a bit of a stretch to connect that to debates about um, neoplasticism versus concrete art, um, it certainly is not a stretch to think about a dialectic between um, the indigenous and the rational that at times seems to use or a continuous movement as we saw both in photography and later in painting between an imposition of geometry to banish whether it's Torres Garcia or uh, certain kinds of photography. Though in problematizing that, I mean, I think that uh, the, as we heard this afternoon, the parangale of Oidesica in some sense pulls the indigenous back into, uh, if not geometry, a uh, form of art that began in a geometric. Um, and finally, I was also very struck by how the connection between geometry and left-wing politics, which I had, because I've been working on concrete painting, always associated with that, may actually have had a rich discourse a uh, generation before in photography, before um, it comes into painting and sculpture in Argentina, and that would be something that I think would be worth exploring. So I think that probably is enough for, for me, um, but um, once again, thank all the speakers, the audience, Jennifer De La Fuente and the coordinators. And stay tuned, because this is not the only dose you're going to be getting uh, from us of scholarship related to these topics. There's still a uh, book related to the Metropolis exhibition to come and a second publication
to do with making art concrete, as well as continuing projects on uh, pre-Hispanic and colonial uh, Latin America. So thank you and enjoy what's left of the weekend. Thank <laughs> you.